Welcome to the We Working Women 2021 Masterclass. My name is Ashley Au, and I am an instructor for We Working Women courses on personal branding and public relations. I'm also founder of Owen Company, a public relations firm. Today at We Working Women Masterclass, we are delighted to be joined by Barry McInerney. Barry is president and CEO of McKenzie Investments, a leading global asset manager with over 180 billion dollars under management. Barry has an incredibly impressive career trajectory with over 25 years of experience in the investment management industry, leading Canadian, US and global investment businesses. He's also well recognized for his leadership as a global minded CEO, embracing the ideas of diversity, inclusion and sustainability. Today, our masterclass is going to be a dialogue with Barry and we will take a deep dive into his story, learning about his path and hearing from him on becoming a CEO and the qualities and values that he believes are integral to powerful leadership. Welcome, Barry. Thank you, Ashley. It's very, it's very nice to be here and thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much for joining us. So Barry, you are president and CEO of McKenzie Investments and in today's masterclass, we want to hear from you about your personal story and the values and insights that you think it takes to be both an effective and impactful leader. And um, I want to kick off by asking you a question and it will give, give everyone a sense about, you know, where do you stand on these things? So a lot of aspiring business leaders struggle with the mantra, pursue your passion. Do you believe that pursuing your passion is key to finding success? And how did you find your passion? Well, that's, that's a good question. I, I think there's been a lot of debate about that lately about, uh, you know, it's, it's the, you, you optimize your career when you follow your passion. And I don't know if that's quite true. First of all, I hope you have a lot of passions outside of your career, no side of work, your family and sports or arts or what have you. But I, I do say that, you know, your career beginning, middle end is, is a, a continuous discovery of what you like and what you are passionate about. And, uh, you know, I, I started out, um, I think like all of us, you know, nothing replaces hard work. So <laughs> work hard. Um, and um, I think it's, it's important to find what you're good at, first and foremost, because I think if you're, if you're good at something, and that might be a discovery process, then that builds confidence and you start to like it. And, you know, so liking something can easily turn into a passion. It did for me. I, I'm an actuary, in fact, and so I went through all the actual exams, all 10 of them, years and years of studying. And then after two, three years of being an actuary, I said, hmm, I, you know what? I'm, I want to go into investments. So I guess that was my discovery of asking people, talking to people, taking some risks in my career, switching out of the comfort of being an actuary to, into his nascent investment business at Mercer that I, that I joined. Um, and then I joined it and um, I loved it. So I'm not answering your question directly because I don't think it's, it's that simple. I, I think it's a discovery process of, of working hard, seeing what you like, asking questions, getting mentors to give you advice. But ultimately you, you do settle into something that I think marries what you're good at and what you like to yes, it becoming a lifelong passion. And I've been at this uh, nearly 30 years now and I feel like I'm just mid-career, to <laughs> be honest with you, because I, I really enjoy investments. So yes, I have found my passion in investments, but I am passionate about other things. I'm passionate about my family and my children, and my Rose, my wife, my grandkids, and I like sports. So, you know, it's not like you, you can have more than one passion in life and, you, and your passion can obviously uh, cover a broad spectrum of both career orientation and personal orientation. So. Let me ask you this because a lot of our We Working Women audiences were at different points in our professional career or maybe as business owners, and we all tend to idolize the title of CEO. <laughs> Did you have like a light bulb moment where you thought CEO is where I want to go? <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> and I, I would I would think you asked most CEOs of uh, the fact that then they came out of high school or came out of university, ah, I want to be a CEO. All of us would say, absolutely not. You just, you start your career and it's it's a journey, right? And, uh, you know, for me, I wanted to, well, first of all, become an actuary, finish my exams. Then I really wanted to be a thought leader and, in, and a, a contributor and and um, do all the good stuff. And then I just started to manage people. I, I, by the way, I started to like it and I was pretty good at it. And then I started early days, I had great mentors who gave me a, a business to run at a very early age. And 
wow, this is really, I like this. I like running a business and the strategy and execution of the strategy and working with a team and building a team and, mm -hmm. and building clientele and, and working forward in terms of this, you know, all aspects. So I guess I'm, I'm probably your proverbial mile wide and inch deep person. But if you're the other way around, you might be, you might be a great surgeon. I, I think I'd be a horrible surgeon, by the way, because I, I have found in my discovery over years, right? That I do like juggling a lot of things, multitasking and, and constantly working and tweaking on, on to me running a business. And yes, that, that became, that ultimately uh, landed me CEO positions. I've been running in businesses for over 20 years now, actually, I'm a CEO for 15 years. And, um, but no, it's, I don't think anyone would say that was a, a specific journey you're on. It's just, you found out what I found out what I liked and what I was good at. I found out what I wasn't like, wasn't good at. I learned from my mistakes, lots of mistakes. So you got to be humble and self-actualize and say, Hmm, could have done that better. And then work on your, um, work on your areas that you need to work on. And I, I'll speak to that in a moment uh, later on. I think you might ask something about communication because everyone asks about communication and being a CEO, absolutely critical. And I was horrible at it when I was early in my career. So we'll talk about it later, but totally. like working on what you're doing, what you're good at. Um, but I like being a CEO and, and whatever title you call it, I, I like being, I like leadership. I, I, I like leadership, I, it's dynamic, it's constantly changing. The world is constantly changing. Your team is constantly changing and and your clients are constantly changing. And, and that's probably what I most like to do. I like leading through change. How's that? <laughs> That's excellent. Um, I think that a lot of us think of the investment business as being really dog eat dog and competitive. And I mean, maybe I can dive a little bit deeper into this, but now that you've been in senior leadership for so long and you've been in a CEO position for over 15 years, could you tell us what do you think are the main qualities that make someone a successful CEO? You obviously have that staying power. Well, I don't know any particular order. I, I think you um, you have to recognize the fact that you um, the world is always changing. The investment in management industry, like a lot of industries, right? I love the invest. I love the investment and management industry. But it's the famous McKinsey quote that says, you know, assets and products, a third of assets, thirty three percent, a third of assets in products five years from now, are those products don't exist today. Constantly shifting and moving. Uh, it's very global in nature. So I think that you have to, um, you know, just, uh, uh, you're really good at accepting change and, um, and embracing change and using it to your advantage. So I'm in an industry that changes very quickly as others do, but I recognize that. So always looking out for trends and movements and changes in investor sentiment. And by the way, um, our industry is very fascinating. I have the fortunate to be, run, I've run global businesses before, US and Canada and Europe, Middle East and Asia. So I, I've seen the, the um, uh, I'm, gonna use, I'm gonna use a Canadian hockey term, sorry, but the, the puck moves, right? In different ways, depending on the region you're in. But interesting enough, a lot of those trends come to various regions at particular points in time. And I, when I came back to run a Canadian company five years ago, uh, it was 15 years in the United States, in New York, Chicago. I was fortunate enough to have seen trends outside of Canada that I thought were coming to Canada. Now, sometimes they come, sometimes they don't. They normally do come to Canada, and then sometimes they manifest themselves differently, and sometimes they come identically to Canada. But we, as a team now, have always looked at those trends globally that are always shifting and say, oh, okay, we better get ahead of that. You know, ETFs, alternative investments, uh, sustainable investing, um, uh, all these areas that are now in full bloom in Canada weren't really full bloom five years ago. And so we're always trying to accept change, looking forward, um, getting ahead, ahead of the game. And, and ultimately my, my, you know, the, the North star is do what's best for your client first and foremost, like what's, what's best for the, our clients are ultimately the investors. What we do is we think is good for them. So when we're thinking of trends and new products, new innovation, it's not like, okay, how can we make a lot of money out of this one idea, this one product? No, it's, does this improve the retirement journey for an investor, particularly Canadian retail investors? If it does, then we'll do it. If it doesn't, won't do it. Now, yes, if you're successful at it and design it properly and you market it properly and package it properly and 
and then yes, people use it. Then the byproduct of that is success, you know, business success, uh, you know, other aspects of success. We can find, we can talk about what success is, by the way, later on. But you got to keep focused as a north star on on the end investor and what's best for them, and you'll never go wrong. You know, I mean, you know, this Steve Jobs at Apple's anybody you talk to uh, about him and his iconic leadership and others, they were relentless about building and ensuring that what was appropriate was in the best interest of their clients and customers. And you do that, then everything just really just uh, sounds so simple, but everything like that falls by the wayside. So that's, um, anyways, that's what I've learned by trial and error over the last 25 years. Yeah, you definitely do make it sound so simple. And I think Barry, anyone that's been following up until this point in our conversation would would be impressed by your authenticity and approachability. And I think that something we, we really um, get to know about you. Anyone that's interacted with you or with Mackenzie on social media would say, you're a real communication superstar. You're able to break down Mackenzie's CEO strategy to, in layman's terms to someone that might be at the very early stages in their careers or in leadership. So could you tell me, I mean, you're so great in interviews and in your pub for business leaders. I mean, now we've had a year of being here on Zoom. Um, we're in the 21st century. What What is the connection between communications and effective leadership? Oh, goodness. It's it's everything. And over the years, um, you know, you, you, you communicate more and more and you communicate to so many different audiences and stakeholders here. Obviously, your employees first and foremost, and then hopefully new employees and recruits and your customers and then future customers and prospects. And you might have senior leadership, might have boards, um, regulators, you're just communicating all the time and you feel like you're repeating yourself, but you can never over communicate. You never can, you can never over communicate. I, I, I mentioned early days that I, I have observed over the years how effective communication is. It's interesting, I'll, I'll, I'll give a um, exercise for someone listening, hopefully watching this video. And I started this uh, probably 10, 15 years ago. Sometimes you listen to someone, a great speaker speak, like Barack Obama, you know, th that type of orator. And mostly, obviously, you're listening to the message. Well, actually, try this out. Uh, listen to the message, because that's what you're there to listen to great speakers. But then play it again and watch how they communicate and study their communication, study their cadence and the uh, inflection of their voice and their pauses and their use of their hands. Do it that way as well. And you can see, oh, uh, that's a really effective way to communicate. And it's difficult to do that because you're just so interested in the message, but, but try it twice and do it over and over. And you, you start to learn from great communicators why they're so good. Mm -hmm. um, and I mentioned earlier that I was, I, was, I was a shy child. I was always very shy. And I didn't, public speaking was just, you know, as we know, the, you know, the, the, the second worst fear of everybody is death and the first worst worst fear is public speaking right <laughs> and I'm just not very good at it but i had to put myself in uncomfortable situations to get again better at what i wasn't good at i actually um signed up and i i taught university one course a term for seven years university of toronto my old alma mater and i i did that because i i like academia and i like teaching and you know like, like everybody else does but i also found out that when i was in front of a class that really helped me with my speaking and asking questions or answering questions rather than Q&A extemporaneously. Um, and there's so many different ways of communicating that as, as you become a more and more senior leader that you have to be adept at. There's the just doing a presentation, right? Five, 10, 15 minutes PowerPoint. There's doing that without a PowerPoint. You have to pitch your communication depending on the, on the, on the audience, sophisticated audience. Maybe they know your topic, maybe they don't. Um, you have to do speeches where I like I have to do regular ones where we're reading it because it's a prepared text of so could be an annual general meeting, but you have to read it, but make it natural, very difficult and to learn that so it's incredible how many uh, communication to me is is one of the greatest challenges as a leader can have and and most satisfying so it's absolutely everything over communicate and of course the 21st century, particularly the pandemic my goodness. Uh, nothing is more important. How do you, because now we're, I've been running McKenzie, we're fortunate to have a, uh, an industry, an asset management industry that you can run virtually. 
Some industries you cannot. We were, we were very lucky to do that. So I've been running this business globally, virtually for 10 months. And um, you ask questions like, okay, we a lot of Zoom, a lot of team meetings, and actually use this as your advantage to, to have more communication, more, more one-on-ones, more going to teams, talking to you, more employee forums, talking to your clients. You can actually be much more efficient this way than if you're traveling around in a plane or in a cab or walking to meet building the building. But what we're going to have to be challenged with uh, once this, this will pass at some point, this pandemic, right? is uh, how, do you, how do you keep your culture and build your culture? Because what we're gonna go back to is probably more of a hybrid world. I mean, obviously we'll hopefully all get back to the office, we can see each other again, but this is fundamentally change how business is gonna be conducted, the pandemic, where these 15 year trends have come to us immediately. And so we'll go back to a hybrid world and which is good, allows employees to, to have more work-life balance, maybe come in the office half the time, whatever makes best sense for them. Someone. Don't feel guilty about not coming in. If you got to take care of an aged parent or your children or go to a doctor's, go for it, right? So, so that's great. And that's what's going to be the benefit of a work-life uh, experience in the hybrid world. But the communication is going to be critical in terms of creating the culture if we're not always going to be gathered together like we all are. So we're going to think that one through. This is this is effective way of doing it, but you're going to have the hybrid even where you're going to have a meeting in a boardroom with 10 people and maybe 10, 10 are going to be Zooming in. So now I have your 20, you gotta, you gotta make it feel like you've got a room of 20 people building your culture and having interactive discussion and facilitating it and not talking so much like I'm doing right now and making sure other people are talking. <laughs> but that's also gonna be a challenge in a hybrid world that we're gonna all have to work on and, and we're thinking it through, so. Barry, I wanna come back to you um, on the communications in the 21st century because you are so present on social media, not just through Mackenzie's platform, but we see you oftentimes accepting awards or speaking about certain initiatives that Mackenzie has via social media. What do you think about senior business leaders and CEOs being a part of social media presence in terms of communications? Well, you know, we decided to do it collectively, obviously, you know, my, my team and we thought about it. Yes. Why don't we, why don't I get out there and, and on behalf of Mackenzie and, and my other leaders get out there and we thought, why don't we use social media and um, to again, because our, our mantra at Mackenzie, which could vary by companies, ours is um, we want to be your business partner. We're working with advisors. We, we want to be thought leaders. And so because of that, we didn't want to interrupt that activity because of the, the pandemic. So we really shifted gears quickly and moved hard uh, towards using more social media. And um, I get a lot of help with that, by the way. <laughs> but it's, um, you know, it's it's hard work, I'd be honest with you, because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sitting, I'm, you know, running a reasonably sized, good sized business, and I'm probably in front of this screen 10 hours a day. Then I get to do work at night. I mean, I actually got my work job to do in terms of you know emails and strategy and budgets, things like that. So any of the videos we're doing is all on the weekend. Um, and shout out to my beautiful uh, spouse Rose, who runs her own business, Womanscape. But you know, someone needs to since we're all at home, someone needs to do all the videos. So she's I did I think I did thirty videos last year, all on the weekends, uh, one weekend, uh, one video every weekend. So it takes work to do, but we thought it was important and collectively, uh, the team at McKenzie's. So I did it. And, um, you know, there's so many different messages that you can convey. And we were, we wanted to make sure that we, the, the markets, I mean, we lived in a, a very serious decline in capital markets, right? Last February, March. I mean, that was the worst decline we've seen since the Great Depression. And um, the economic contraction was the worst on record we've ever experienced, by the way. So that was pretty serious. And so we also wanted to get out there and, and calm nerves and give our perspectives, put it, put it everything, um, try to explain what's going on. And we, you know, so um, now we have to understand as any leaders out there, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not the chief investment officer. I'm not, I'm not running the money. I'm not the marketing expert. I'm not the product expert. I'm not the sales expert. I'm the CEO running all of it. But um, we thought it was important that I, at least I convey the messages at the top of the house um, the best I can. And then uh, anything we needed to drill down on, like in terms of you know, uh, detail in the capital markets, we could get our 
chief investment officer and strategist to do that. So it's a great team effort. Um, it was a lot of work. Um, we're glad we did it. And we actually felt a sense of responsibility too. I mean, the, the fact of the matter is when you come a, a, a particular level of seniority in, in a company or in the industry, you do have a responsibility. And the uh, fact of the matter is we thought it was important to get out there and, and uh, calm nerves. Um, those that actually, by the way, stayed fully invested last year were rewarded. Whereas you felt, you know, the, the world was falling apart. Let me just pull out and put, put it in the mattress. <laughs> but if you didn't do that, you were rewarded for that. Uh, because we had, you know, experiences in the great, you know, the financial dislocation in 2008, 2009, when the markets were very uh, unruly as well. But, you know, fiscal monetary stimulus came in from the governments and central banks. We saw it before in an unprecedented speed and breadth and depth, and that calmed the markets down. And then we, you know, obviously took it from there. So just an example of the fact that um, we had to be adaptive. We had to pivot uh, to the environment, which changed incredibly so. Um, we felt it was important to, yes, let's up our communication, but do it in a manner of um, uh, thought leadership, calming nerves, uh, and a, a sense of responsibility to, to offer our perspectives, like other companies were, um, to put the whole environment situation in, in the proper perspective because it was so unnerving. Once, when you're in a, when you're in a, a shock, it's unnerving and it's uncomfortable. And so it's good to hear from the experts that we, we can add some comfort, some small way as to here's what's happening, here's the way forward, um, and here's what you should do to weather the storm, so to speak. So that's, that's what we decided to do. Yeah, um, I think there's definitely a, a bigger space, right, for CEOs to take as society as a whole. Like we kind of look to the leaders of business and especially when you have clients whose assets you're managing, that's one part. But I could say that even as someone who might not fit the requirements to be able to invest with McKenzie, um, it's reassuring to have a voice out there that helps decipher what's going on in the world. And I think you've done an excellent job of mm -hmm. filling up that space. And you mentioned the word thought leadership. Yes. And um, I, I would really like to get a little bit of an idea of why you describe it that way. And how, how does that correlate not just to McKenzie, but to Barry. Mm -hmm. And why, why is thought leadership important to you as a leader? Yeah, and it's a well-worn ter well term, thought leadership, as we know. But it's, um, I've always felt, and I, I've tried to work hard myself personally to understand um, the industry I'm in and understand the capital markets. And I'm, you know, I'm a CFA as well. So I, I went back to write my CFA exams after all those actual exams, because I felt that was the best way to speed up my knowledge on investments, because I, I, I wanted to understand investments very well. Even if I'm not managing the money, like my investment team does, I'm the CEO and a CEO of a consumer product business or um, you know, investment banking business or, or, or an asset management business, you think you should know your business, right? You should. So I always felt it was important that I, I have a, a good knowledge of uh, investments. Uh, and uh, it's like, I know enough to be dangerous, which is great. So, so, so thought leadership to me was, I'm, so I do a lot of reading too, because I, I again, um, I, I want the business, which ultimately I'm responsible for, to move forward, to be future oriented, to look for the trends, so do a lot of, lot of um, studying and got a lot of input coming in <laughs> through the email and airwaves. Uh, what's how things are uh, unfolding globally in the industry, as I mentioned before. Uh, so I like to keep on top of that. I've got a, you know, again, any CEO has, again, head of their departments that are doing that more in detail. But I think it's important for me top down to understand what's going on and challenge them. And here's what I'm seeing. And let's marry these trends. And, and, and again, most importantly, um, the thought leadership that I want to convey, I hope, helps ultimately the investor, because when I'm explaining the benefits of global diversification, you know, you know, why invest in China? You know, I'm a big advocate investing in China. Well, why? Well, it's the second largest stock market in the world, so you should start investing. It's good for you. And 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 I've always been, as an example, impressing upon investors. It's not necessarily uh, the great returns that, is, that the Chinese stock market has given you recently. It's the risk diversification it gives you because their economy is the new economy. And our economies in North America and Europe, as an example, are, uh, I won't say the old economy, but the more traditional economy. So when you put the two together, you've got a much better diversified portfolio, as an example. So that type of thought leadership is 
I guess that's my personal style. I don't like pushing product. Um, I want to get someone there that they feel, yes, this, this is why I should invest in this manner. Obviously, if they want to use McKinsey products, that would be wonderful. <laughs> but, um, you know, what I've been trying to work on as a leader of asset management business for 15 years, and I, I, I brought this back to Canada, is solution selling as an example of thought leadership. Don't go out there and push the hot product that we have that's doing very well the last quarter or 12 months or 24 months. Hey, this is good for you. No, step back, look at someone's portfolio, each and every portfolio say, I think I can approve that if we included these three or four pieces and why and demonstrate why these three or four pieces, which could vary by portfolio, helps with your overall uh, return profile and, and, and again, can help you with your retirement journey. That's a bit of a, that's a, bit of a journey in itself, solution selling, not product pushing, but that's something I've been very passionate about amongst other things of leading companies um, and that is tied directly to thought leadership. Uh, always understand how your products can benefit or future product can benefit your client and understand their needs specifically and then try to work with how we can improve the advisor portfolio or, or the client's portfolio, if that makes sense. So that's, what, that's why I, I, think thought, you know, I think CEOs have also an obligation uh, given their perch and given most, most of us have been around a little while <laughs> maybe too long sometimes, uh, you know, we've seen a lot, right? And, and uh, you know, even as, you know, investment industry, I, capital markets, I've seen ups and downs for 30 years. So again, um, as you add on the years of your experience, you can bring those to light in a thought leadership framework and help, help the industry, help your clients to, to be better. So if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I really want to thank you for the this kind of going deep on the thought leadership because it really brings across to our audience how multifaceted and demanding it is to be an effective CEO and the amount of personal investment that it takes that you have to invest on the weekends and in your spare time, not just managing the business and profitability, but also where's the future and what's your role as an individual in leading that. And um Earlier, you mentioned a few things that you did for self-improvement and betterment, like teaching at a university and working on becoming a strong orator. I'm wondering if you had role models or CEOs in your mind or thought leaders in your mind that were an inspiration to you. I'm sure you will be the inspiration to many watching today. But if you have an idol that you could share with us, we'd love to know who it is. Oh, goodness. <laughs> I mean, I, uh, many of you, if you look at my bio, you can tell I worked 19, my first 19 years, I worked at one company, Mercer. And I did a lot of, and the other thing, by the way, you can have a lot of different careers in one organization. There's nothing wrong, by the way, these days. I think we're, we're more apt, maybe the millennials, they, they move around a lot. They, they got a little bit of a reputation for that, which is fine. You, you, want to, you want to be the best you can be, and sometimes you need to change environment. But you could do a lot of different, many careers at one company. I, I mean, I was... I was an actual analyst at Mercer and I became a pension actor for three, four years, then an investment consultant. Then I started leading businesses um, in Canada and then I moved down to the US. They moved, they moved me down to the United States, New York, just before 9-11, by the way, in 2001. And so that's what brought me to the United States. And then I ran US businesses and that gave me an opportunity to run a national and global business. So, so all that within 19 years, one company, I probably had six careers. So, but within, you know, those, you, you tend to, you tend to reflect back. I'm, 57 now, you tend to reflect back on who are your mentors. Probably you reflect back in your first five or 10 years of your career. I mean, I've had mentors throughout my entire life, but you're obviously when you're younger, early in your career, you you reflect on mentors. And I, some of these names you may not be aware of, but uh, you know, Malcolm Hamilton is an iconic retirement expert in Canada, Mercer actuary. I mean, just, I mean, one of the smartest people I've ever met. And that's where I learned, um, you know, not just the importance of, thought leadership and understanding your subject matter but important i've never met someone who's so brilliant to spend so much time to how to communicate simply a complex topic because a lot of us do complex work right but but that doesn't do you any good to the end consumer your client we can't convey it in simple terms so that was what i i got from him um the uh Someone who, by the way, just retired as the CEO of Sun Life, Dean Connor. And Dean Connor was my boss twice at Mercer. Uh, he was the, in both Canada and he moved down to the United States. And so he was my boss twice and uh, learned a lot from him. I learned from him strategy. 
work really hard on creating your strategy because you have to execute on your strategy. And as, as I do now, I, I've learned this you know, through hard knocks, your strategy should be always on strategy approached. It's always shifting and moving. You, you might have to set your one and five year plan as we all do every year, but it has to move and you have to be able to pivot and shift even sometimes within a year. So I learned that from him to say, you know, spend a lot of time in your strategy. Again, where cheese is moving and take advantage of that. Uh, by the way, you don't want to be too far ahead of the cheese sometimes, <laughs> but you're going to have to be adaptive and move around a little bit. And uh, also, I must admit, I, I have to uh, be proud of the fact that I was, I have been in industries that are fairly male dominant. And that's another topic we want to talk about later on in terms of gender diversity, because um, you know, I've been working hard at that and I'm in a, a good, a good perch to do that with my strong partner of life of 37 years and, you know, daughters and granddaughters and a matriarch of a mother who still uh, controls her eight children, including me number seven. <laughs> but um, I ha I've had, I've had two, I had two women bosses early in my career. And I thought that should be, well, well big deal, but that was been the late eighties and the nineties. And that was early, right? Particularly in industries that were male dominant. Yeah. Um, and uh, that I, 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 I'm really um, proud to say I didn't, that didn't really, wasn't a big deal for me. Uh, you know, like it might've been a big deal here, you know, back then, but no, I, I'm, I'm glad I had uh, some uh, two women CEOs that I reported to and uh, that helped, to be honest with you. I think just with my view of, of how, uh, I probably understand it better today, by the way, than I did at age 27 or 37, but how important diversity of thought is you know, gender and, and all aspects of, of diversity. Diversity works. So we might get in that in a bit, but I, so anyway, so lots of, lots of mentors, reach out to your mentors, by the way, uh, we are, you know, you're a lot younger than I am, but in your career, if anyone comes to you and asks a question, asks for help, everyone likes to help. Like don't, it's a really, it's a really nice rewarding feeling, isn't it? To teach some a concept to somebody or help them out, give them advice. And, and uh, you know, so um, being shy that it was early days, I came out of that shell and asked a lot of questions and asked for help, a lot of help. And I got the help I, I required to make me, uh, you, know, a, you know, the best I could be. That, that's excellent advice. Well, let's jump right into that diversity question because obviously you've been surrounded um, by a number of very strong women in your family, family life, and um, I think also professionally. So tell us about your thought leadership and, and your commitment to diversity. Well, I, and I think it's, it's you, you, I must admit, you just, you just kind of wake up sometime. I probably woke up about 10 or 12 years ago. So being in the investment industry, asset management industry, you're just working away and you're doing your thing and you finally step back and go, wait a minute here. <laughs> Do you know that 82% of CFAs globally are men? And I didn't know that till 10 or 12 years ago. And that's a remarkable statistic because if you look at lawyers and doctors and accountants and um, even actuaries, uh, although we still need a lot more gen uh, female representation in those, in those professionals, they have a higher percentage of female representation than, than uh, CFAs do. So that was quite interesting that we have an industry asset management that is pronouncedly male dominant, particularly in the areas of, of portfolio management, CFA types, and um, uh, selling, wholesaling, interesting. Both are over 80% uh, men, and even advisors are or, over 80% men. So the whole industry has historically been. And so um, that's... Um, that's ultimately not, not going to be a successful model <laughs> for a couple of reasons. Number one, diversity has scientifically been proven to improve outcomes. It does. I mean, you can't, you can't refute that. If you put a diverse group together, it's been scientifically proven that their outcome of what they come up with, whatever they come up with, is going to be better than a non-diverse group. It's been proven over and over again. Um, second of all, women control uh, almost half the wealth in North America, and they'll control the majority of the wealth just a number of reasons, demographically, live longer, in a workforce, a lot more in leadership positions as you should be. So um, it's, it's you know, you, you want to be altruistic about doing things, but it's good business to have diversity for those two reasons and other reasons. So um, working pretty hard at it. I, I have been working hard at it for, um, you know, over 10 years now. When I, when I came up, 
Canada and, and came back to Canada to run McKenzie, the first thing I did was um, I wanted to send a signal that I think is important that we have greater gender uh, balance. Uh, yeah, we, we launched a campaign, Better Together, which was uh, and specifically intended to have women and men, when they work in, in, in better balance, produce better results. Um, but I gathered all the senior women when I probably the first six months, once I got settled into the CEO McKenzie in, in, uh, for a three hour meeting, supposed to be an hour and a half, went to three hours over lunch. And I want to talk to him about, I wanted to launch a, uh, a women leadership mutual fund and ETF. Found this terrific firm in the United States, PAX, that does research on um, publicly traded companies that have, uh, have some characteristics, you know, percent of women on the board, uh, C suite, et cetera. And they had proven that over 10 years, uh, that particular subset of companies have produced almost 30% higher return equity over 10 years. It's wow. Incredible. incredible. Wow. So I wanted to launch that uh, fund, a McKinsey Women Leadership Mutual Fund ETF, with them subsidizing it. Because I think that's not only, is, uh, first and foremost, is, it's a great investment value thesis that you put money to work and you'll do, you, you can get strong returns. I think that's always the thing you lead with. But second of all, I want to promote externally that gender diversity was important to us. I didn't know how else to do it, but as an asset management company, why don't you launch a product that is all about women leadership? But I wasn't going to do that unless the women at McKenzie said it's okay because I didn't want to be disingenuous because I had, had to commit to them, which I did. I said, listen, our gender diversity at McKenzie, it's been almost five years since I arrived, is not where it should be. Nowhere near should be. And it's an industry issue, it's, but that's that's not an excuse. It's just the fact that our industry is again over eighty percent assets managed by men. Uh, we need to change that. So, um, but I want to launch this fund just to show show that send a signal that gender diversity is real, uh, it's important, and it makes societal sense, good sense, and business sense. So I got approval from the women to do it. So we launched it, and I'm working very hard internally. So you know, inside out, outside in, and said, okay, listen, like. Like, um, and let's be systematic about it. You know, let's look at our employee force, about a thousand employees, you know, how's the gender breakdown by division and by senior uh, levels and, um, and how can we improve this? And so it's a journey and we've made some really good improvements. I've, I've added five women to my, my executive committee wow. the last 18 months, really proud of that. Not because they're women, because they're really good. <laughs> and the, 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 the discussions that we have are so much better because we have more diversity. And so now obviously, um, you know, we, we lead with gender diversity because it's, it's, it's such a um, pronounced imbalance in my industry, but we embrace all aspects of diversity. I'm, I'm a proud board member of a Black North Initiative and signed the CEO pledge. And so uh, Blacks, people of color, um, Indigenous, you know, we're, we're, we're working hard to get improvement upon the entire milieu of diversity and we should look more like society, um, but the gender we led with, making progress, more to come. Um, but ultimately, we think that more diversity means better investment returns, which means good thing for our clients. Basically. Better together. Be better together, yes, thank you. <laughs> well, I mean, here at We Working Women, we're a predominantly female audience so i'm sure we have other viewers as well but i want to thank you for taking the leadership on this because you are really a global example of what it means for a ceo to take the reins and drive that change to happen and i mean i want to pivot a little bit here and talk about we know you're a really global-minded ceo and you've had a long-standing commitment to the china market Yes. And I understand that McKenzie has had a representative office in China since 2018. And under your leadership, um, McKenzie has really strengthened not only the business side of China, but also people to people relations. But maybe first, you could tell us a little bit about why under your leadership has McKenzie had this commitment to the China market? Well, I, um, so my prior employer before joining McKenzie, I oversaw also our, uh, our international U.S. international asset management businesses, including China, we had a uh, a large um, stake in a asset management company uh, locally in China. So I got experience for five plus years before joining McKenzie, and then the second day on the job at McKenzie, I got a call from the CEO of Power saying, "Listen, need your help. We're going to make a big investment in a company uh, in China, China Asset Management Corporation. It's publicly known that 
McKenzie and our ultimate power, uh, uh, ultimate parent company power, we've made the single largest foreign investment in a um, Chinese asset management company in CAMC. So that sharpened my attention, obviously. <laughs> and then we wanted to be obviously on the ground because I think it's always important that, that we, we have this wonderful relationship and investment, minority interest in CAMC. But McKinsey, we want us to be on the ground in China and be a Chinese company. I've always felt when running global businesses that when you're running a business, McKinsey in Canada, we, we want to be viewed as Canadian. We have a small presence in the United States. We want to be viewed as you know, an American company, European company a Chinese company in China. So you know, teams on the ground. Um, and it's really, um, you know, it's from that st strategic business perspective, it, it, it's so compelling to, um, to be in China. Uh, as we know, 50% um, of all the flows of our investment industry globally, half the flows over the next couple of decades, it's a hundred trillion dollar industry, by the way, too, in assets. 50% of the flows will emanate from China. You know, it's become the second largest stock market in the world, you know, second largest bond market in the world, second largest economy, soon to be largest economy, probably before 2030 now, given that it's recovery from COVID. And um, second largest retire retirement market soon in the world. It's, it's a big market. So you need to be there. A, it's a great business opportunity for us in the asset management retirement space. B, you can't be global unless you have a China representation. Like, think about that. Like that, they just cannot be global anymore without having presence, partnership in China. And then, so that allows us with this investment in locally in China for us to participate with a great partner in that enormous growth going on. But then we can also bring their capabilities, uh, our Chinese partners and Chinese equities and fixed income. And again, and bring them to Canadian investors because it's good for them. Right, and it, it hasn't been as accessible the markets in China up until about two, three years ago. Now it's very accessible. You know, we have a Chinese equity mutual fund, Chinese equity ETF, McKenzie, others do. We're launching, it's, it's in register, I could say, we're launching a Chinese uh, fixed income mutual fund uh, this quarter. So that allows Canadians to invest. So how can you, again, have a global portfolio as a Canadian or American or European without having a presence in China? We are, there's one certainty in, in the industry, um, Every investor outside China is underweight China <laughs> because if it's the second largest stock market and bond market in the world and you're sitting there zero or even half percent, one percent, you're underweight. So you need to start the journey to invest in China. So it takes a lot of thought, leadership, education. Um, and yes, we have these palpable, tangible diplomatic tensions, right? They, they exist. And, and these, these tensions exist with, between any two countries at any point in time. It's not the first time, won't be the last time, whatever countries they are. And they're there and they're palpable. But you know, we've always taken the view that, uh, and our Chinese partners have too, that let's push it. Okay, let's have that resolved at the diplomatic level. And we will resolve it. And it's unfortunate for both countries, right? But it will be resolved at, at the diplomatic level. But for us, we're just doing business to business, people to people. And we're, we're working with our partners uh, in China and, and they're based in Beijing. And so I, in fact, I think the relationship has been, no, has been strengthened during the unfortunate diplomatic tensions, because we're just saying, listen, let's just work together. Because us coming to China and making investment with them and trying to teach them some North American best practices, because we've been at it longer, makes them better. And then they make us better, uh, A, not just because of these uh, capabilities that we want to put in the hands of Canadians, but also, uh, for instance, they have much better technology we have. I mean, I mean, they don't legacy systems because their industry is only 20 years old. We being a 50 year old industry, we have a lot of legacy systems and technology that we're trying to deal with, whereas they've skipped a couple of generations. Right? So, so it's a wonderful relationship. It's mutually beneficial. It has to be two way, it has to be bilateral. And I think it's gonna be strengthened. So that's why we're there and we're proud to be there. And it's important to be there. And it's important to, as a global player to be there. And um, we think they're terrific. And and do hope that the diplomatic tensions at some point come to resolution, but that's not um, that's not uh, impeding us to just continue to do what we're doing business to business with our partners. Excellent. Yeah, that's so energizing to hear in times like these.
Justice. And another thing that we've noticed through our We Working Women community is that Mackenzie has also, at the same time that you've been doing business with China, looked at strengthening people to people relations and educating girls of rural China is an organization that's familiar to We Working Women. Um, but let's just talk a little bit about it. You have done some philanthropic giving that has an impact in China, along with developing Mackenzie's China business. Why did you decide to do that? Well, I think it, I think at the top, at the um, the macro level, when we're committed now to China, and not just with our partnership with CMC, but now we're on Mackenzie. China exists, and we're on the ground and there for decades to come. We want to show our commitment locally, and um, every country, you know, um, I mean, China's doing so well economically, and you know, the rising middle class, middle class is. It's huge right now, but like any country, you've got pockets of um, individuals that are disadvantaged or struggling. And educating girls in rural China, when that came to our attention, said, oh my goodness, wow, like what a, and you've known it better, longer than I have, Ashley. It's it's an amazing organization, what Ching has done. And we said immediately, we, we got to help out. Um, and obviously, yes, it, it also aligned with the fact that, um, you know, gender diversity and our promotion of women and um, trying to um, financial literacy of women and girls investing. So all of it just was a perfect alignment. We jumped at the opportunity to support her and her organization. So we're, we're proud sponsors. Uh, love hearing the feedback. We're, we're fortunate enough, uh, you know, I hopefully get back on a plane soon, back to China, but I, I would go every quarter. And um, uh, occasionally during the year, we would we would meet with them and locally and and uh, Ying Du, who heads up uh, Mackenzie China, and she's just terrific in Beijing. She would coordinate you've done the same you've been there that we can meet some of the some of the girls too that graduate you've gone have been supported through their education and gone on to university and now they have careers and i think it's just it's just uh, heartwarming i mean it, it's it's something if i may say that that it's been important to me and my family personally to give back for a long time and i was so proud not knowing when i joined mckenzie to be the ceo that we we have a 20 year plus mckenzie charitable foundation that in itself is run by employees we all contribute to. And that, that foundation helps small grassroots organizations and charities across Canada, with particular focus on women and disadvantaged families and, and poverty. And so everything just kind of, so it was aligned with our values and, and what we do at the company and, and my values. And um, we couldn't be more pleased. So yeah, we've been, we've been, um, yeah, we've been very active and monitoring all the girls' progress. And um, and thank you for your contribution to that area and your time and effort. It's it's not easy. Um, and um, look forward for years to come to see how everything works out for them. Well, it's wonderful to see the investment industry specifically investing back into society. And I think um, Mackenzie, I understand, has a very strong commitment to sustainability. And I think also sustainable investing. Yes. And could you explain to us a little bit about what does that mean as you're a CEO? What is that? What type of pivot is that and navigating change for you? What does sustainable investing? Mean? Yeah, that's thank you, Ashley. That's a big topic. And it's so important for my industry. <laughs> and so, um, you know, like anything, um, I wanted us to be prominent in sustainable investing. Um, it has so many dynamics to it. So, um, I came back to Canada, we, I immediately said, okay, same thing as the gender diversity, inside out, outside in. I wanted to start to launch sustainable products because we saw a trend which we had seen in Europe and the large institutional investors of Canada, but not the individual investors, but we saw the trend coming. We're individual investors, and again, not just millennials, but we did surveys and others to find out that all of us would like to put some of our money into good work. Uh, with sustainable investing, whatever that might be, the climate, climate uh, environmental and climate work, uh, um, gov good governance, um, gender diversity, what have you. So uh, we launched some, some uh, products. Uh, one of particular note was, uh, again, going to the outside experts, because we weren't experts in managing these types of assets. We, we uh, hired a sub-advisor. I've known the, the chap, uh, John Cook, that launched Green Chip 14 years ago. So we hired Green Chip to launch the McKinsey Global Environmental Equity Fund, which focuses on investing in publicly traded companies that are focused on improving the climate, new energy, clean energy, water, solar, uh, wind, et cetera. So a lot of activity to 
present, obviously, and get in front of a trend, obviously, that we felt that investors wanted, uh, always focusing on the investor. Um, then I, uh, you know, a little a year ago, I said, I need to have a, um, a leader to run all this for me. So Fate Segear, uh, I brought into McKenzie to be the sustainable um, investment leader for McKenzie. And I had to re directly report to me. And I thought that was important because that's not normally the case. Sometimes the head of the sustainable investing or SRI reports into this person or that person. But I said, no, you're reporting directly into the CEO because this is how important it is. And not only that, as we launched some new products for investors, our, our entire $180 billion platform, we have to ensure this ESG, I don't know if environmental social governance is a, a lot of acronyms in our industry, but ESG, I want to go ESG 2.0. So ensure that all the money we're managing, we have a sustainable lens to every company that we're investing in. So we believe that, you know, they've got good valuations, good company, good cash flow, et cetera. And these companies are good corporate citizens towards sustainability. Mm -hmm. There's going to be an enormous reallocation of capital decades to come to sustainable investing. It's enormous. So we're trying to get ahead of that. And uh, so working hard in terms of the whole platform, uh, getting out there, thought leadership, um, new products being launched. And I'm proud to say, um, the global environmental mutual fund we launched with Greenship, um, two years has collected nearly $600 million in assets. Wow. And we're very careful to get out there. It's, you know, the fund has, has gone up 50% plus, you know, over the last 12 months. So we're very, very important not to push that, push the product and push the performance. It's pushing the thesis, saying you invest in companies, it's a win-win. Uh, we think you can get a good return here because these companies uh, have capital allocated to them for decades to come. So you would think that they will be successful. And second of all, you're putting money to good work to, to improve the environment. Well, that's a win-win, that's a right? So that's how we present it. And by the way, um, as they say, um, the relationship went so well, we, we just acquired Greenship and now they're part of McKenzie uh, as an, uh, one of our new boutiques. So it's, uh, it's, a, really, it's a really cool story. And it's just early, early days. Uh, I have to give kudos to Larry Fink, who's the dean of the asset management industry, the CEO of BlackRock, that manages nearly eight trillion dollars, a little bigger than we are. Uh, and and Larry has really pivoted very quickly to talk about this, this this capital allocation to sustainable investing, how important it is, and he's striving at BlackRock to hit a trillion dollars in sustainable oh in over the next five years. He's at two hundred billion already. You know, we're, we're a little McKenzie, we're at 2 billion, uh, hopefully going to 20 billion. So there's different scales here, right? But it's, uh, if we all work hard to speed up the alloc reallocation of capital towards sustainability, then we'll speed up the improvement of the environment and society. And so that's a responsibility again, that we, we're fortunate we manage a lot of capital, all of us. And so let's use that capital for good use and work towards it being reallocated to the areas that society needs. So that's what that's what we're work in progress that we're working on right now. So better again, better together again. Ashley, yes. Yeah, that's really admirable. So for for um, some of our audience members that are listening, I think you've presented a lot of really compelling things about Mackenzie today. I mean, you are gender inclusive and really embracing of diversity, but also sustainability. So if I'm thinking as a retail investor, how do I get in? Where do I, where do I go to learn about opportunities? And can I do that if I'm in China or in Canada? Oh yes. Yeah. So listen, uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing. So China's asset management industry is younger than ours. It's only 20 years. And as we know, the China economy, which is just unbelievable transformation, over you know the last 40 years so they really as you know went through and they never really went through the industrial revolution that we did in the 1880s and 90s so they had to do it uh late and and caught up but over the time you know like we did 100 years ago produced a lot of um, carbon footprint <laughs> but they're working very hard uh right now probably quicker than we did you know, over our 120 years their 40 years to now to reduce that carbon footprint and as you probably uh, saw that uh, President Xi mentioned they'll be carbon neutral by 2060. And then ESG, environmental social governance, which is, um, you know, we've all been working hard as, as asset managers been around over 50 years. They're, the asset management companies in China, CAMC and others have 
have signed the United Nations Principles of Responsible Investing, and they're pushing it really hard. It's a fast train in China too. So there are products now in uh, probably a little more evolved in Canada and US right now than China, but they're coming in China. And you know, I don't want to. I'm not pushing our product, but there's a lot of products out there. But you can, you you want to match your investment. You want to match your personal beliefs to the product and put the money to work. And so, our probably our most our most um, well known sustainable uh, mutual fund is our global environmental um, equity fund. So, but we're we have a lot of things we'll be launching this year in terms of uh, carbon overlay reductions, and uh, it's a really fast moving space. And it's very socially redeeming. So I, I I love it. And you know, after such a long career and hopefully years to come, <laughs> it, it's nice that I can um, devote my attention to getting back to I guess my personal passions. Now now I can now I can now this my vintage can marry to my career passions of gender diversity and sustainable investing. And that's that's a nice thing that I I can. Hopefully someone asked me, you know, I don't like that question. What's going to be your legacy? I don't like that question. I mean, I, you know, we're all the same. We all humans, we work hard and hopefully do some good work day in, day out. But if I, if, if some, if I had to pick two as in terms of what maybe I can influence a little bit uh, over the next coming five or 10 years, it would be gender diversity and sustainable investing. I think that would be, I would be very proud of that's if some small way I contribute to progress at both. And that's my legacy. And aside from my, great family. That's my legacy. <laughs> That's outstanding. I mean, I'd have to say that in this conversation, unexpectedly, I do feel like we've really come full circle on the pursuing your passion. And um, incredibly, it seems like through all of that hard work, you've now found yourself in the position to pursue your passion yet again. And if there's anything inspiring, I think we leave with the we working audience, we working women audience today, it's that you might be pursuing that passion at different steps in your career, right. uh, maybe through some hard work. But thank you for also telling us about ways that we can make an impact while while also um, you know increasing or managing our own assets, which I think is a pressing a pressing question for all professionals at every stage of life. And um, there's a question that I that I, I have to ask you because you've shared so much knowledge with us today, but are we working women readers and subscribers? Many of them are at the early stages of their professional careers and oftentimes business ventures. And I think you see in your clients both. I mean, you see companies and institutions, but you also see individuals and maybe you have some parting advice for that. I sure and and you know again hopefully some of the themes that they heard from me and uh, will help them. Um, I again um, nothing replaces hard work. <laughs> uh, work on your craft. Um, be open to change. Ask questions. Opportunities arise at where you are, where you work. It might be an opportunity to to try a different job, but it might be also just an opportunity to you stay in your existing job, but you're you know, um, they're offering courses on public speaking or understanding topics and getting a deeper knowledge, um, taking professional exams, um, asking for help. Oh, never, never be shy of asking for help. Everyone likes to help. I think we're, I think we're fairly good, you know, humanity here. Everyone likes to help. So ask, ask for help. Don't, don't be shy. You don't know something and you want to help. Um, look for mentors. They don't have to be formal mentors. You, a lot of organizations have formal mentor mentee uh, programs. That's great. I think they're terrific. We have them and others have them, but you could just have informal mentors, and, you know, just so you, you know, have a, I grab a virtual coffee, I guess, <laughs> or something like that. So I think those are just some of the themes. I, I, I don't want to be too pedantic because at the end of the day, um, we're all individuals and you need to be yourself. Uh, there's other thing, be authentic, be yourself. Uh, you know, you don't want to, be someone different at work versus someone different at home. Like, you know, that's not fun. You know, try and enjoy yourself, uh, surround yourself with positivism, you know, look after your body, mind, and soul, particularly now it's important to try to balance that, you know, you know, try to exercise, eat well, get your sleep, work hard at your craft, but, but, you know, work on your soul, um, whatever that is for you. Um, you know, read a book that's entirely different than what you do. You know, not, nothing, nothing worse than you know uh, me being in investments, and then I'll pick up a book about investments. Well, that wouldn't be. Any fun. <laughs> it's, uh, unfortunately, I'll pick up like Malcolm Gladwell or something because I just like that sort of stuff. But you know, something different. 
you know, uh, love, you know, love movies and stuff. So just, just be yourself. But I think, I think, I hope that helps Ashley. I mean, I, 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 I'm always careful about giving advice because everyone's different and, 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 and different careers, different points of their career. And they're, you don't want to, you want to, you know, I give, I'll give one, one anecdote of it on mine. Because I started my career over 30 years ago, right, 1987. Back then, again, getting back to um, being a better communicator, you, I would take these presentation courses, and there was, they'd have one way to be a presenter. You know, you do this, this, and this. And if it wasn't natural for you, oh my goodness, like you feel like a stiff board up there. So it's important just to take who you are and understand who you are, and try to self-actualize and self-reflect, understand what you're good at and what you're, you know, what you're not good at. And, but take who you are. And then take that and and work on it, and over over time, as in a discovery journey, uh, to be the best that you can be. Whatever best means, too. You know, it doesn't have to be CEO for goodness' sake. I mean, just be the best you can be, and 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 take and take who you are, and 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 build that versus trying to be something that you're or someone that you're not. So. I feel like I'm speaking to daughters here. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm being a father now. I hate to sort of be that, but you know, <laughs> that's just some advice. I hope it helps. Thank you so much, Barry. I think this is really outstanding advice. Um, thank you for being a virtual mentor <laughs> to, our, to our audience today, even if it's a short-term mentor, I think. This is really what we're hoping to achieve with Masterclass is delivering so many pearls of wisdom that you've generously shared with us today. You've obviously been open to adventure throughout your career. You've had an open mind and you've absorbed some of the best from different experiences that you've undertaken. And it's really wonderful to hear about the way you lead to also make a positive impact on the people around you and in the world. And we thank you for joining us here at We Working Women Masterclass. Thank you, Ash. It's my pleasure. I really enjoyed this. Anytime.